Next, we have processing data. Now, the two main things we have to think about data, again, the data must be complete and the data must be accurate. And the ways that we check if data is complete and accurate are validation and verification. I'm going to go over these quickly. Data verification is to make sure the data is accurate. When something is accurate, we check it against the original, right? So many websites, they'll actually ask you to put your email address in twice or put your password in twice just to make sure that you typed it correctly the first time. So it verifies the data. That's what it means, okay? To verify something is to check it against the original to make sure it is what is required or make sure it's the same thing. That's how we verify something. Now, data validation to make sure the data is correct. Now, this is again um, done on some websites, but to make sure the data is correct simply means if I ask you for a specific type of data, give me the type of thing I've asked for, right? So, for example, Many websites here in the UK, um, they ask for postcode, right? So if you type something like SE13, um, that's going to be relatively accurate. But if you type something like MMMMM or 12345, that's not going to be accurate. So that data would not be valid. If something is valid, it simply means it is correct. And we do validation checks on data to make sure it is what we've asked for, all right? I'm going to look at two types for each. So I'm going to look at two types of methods used for verification and roughly, again, two types used for validation. So here it says double entry. And this is what's done on most websites. So it asks you again to enter your email address twice, your password twice, proofreading the data, um, asking someone else to check it to ensure that it is the way it should be, right? So these are very two simple things. And again, mostly common sense. Because if you type your email address in once and you've missed something, or for example, I use the American keyboard because that's what I learned to type on. So when I do my at sign, I don't do the at next to the keyboard. I do shift and press number two on the top row of my keyboard. And that's what gives you at on an American keyboard. So sometimes I still make the mistake here in the UK when I'm typing to do that. So it's always a good idea for me to verify by doing a double entry check. So that's all that is. And proofreading, common sense again, if you know you should write it in a particular way, ask someone else to read it. I'm actually working on the content for unit two as we speak. So these are a few of the things I've actually been going over with my class. So this is going to be for data validation. This is something you must be able to do in unit two. And if I'm not mistaken, you should know about five or six of them. So I'm just going to go through the four here because again, it does help you with unit two as well. So a length check, you simply check if the thing is the length you need it to be. So if I ask you to type your surname, right? Some surnames, as we know, the, I think the, the least amount of characters I've ever seen in a surname is two. So the surname must be equal to or greater than two characters long. I've never seen a surname with, a, with 50 or 100 characters. So we can say it needs to be greater or equal to two. And it shouldn't go past, let's say, 2025. We know we have some really long names, right? A lookup table. A lookup table is simply a drop-down list. The user is not able to type in any option by themselves. This is another way that we can validate the data. We can make sure that whatever the user is entering is something that we can accept, something we want to allow. Presence check is a very simple one, which should be done on most fields in every single database or potentially every field. That simply says... Is the data there? If it is not there, give the user an error message, right? So presence, are you present? Is the data present? If the data is not present, meaning that field or that row or column has been left empty, the user should get an error and they should be told to go back and enter the data that um, is needed. Uh, range check, I kind of gave this one away in the length check as well. Range check says um, the numbers should be between this and this. So if it asks for age, right, and you're on some website like Netflix that has adult content, so you like the film you're watching is very gory, you should be over the age of 18 or 21. I think it's safe to assume that if you're like, let's say, 15, 16, you should not be able to watch that film. However, if you're up to 125, I don't think any 125-year-old people are going to be watching Netflix. So within a certain range, we can, we can accept ages. So let's just say 18 to 95 or 80 to 100 whatever the range is you want it to be 
but it's just between two values, between two numbers. After we've captured our data and we've validated and verified the data is correct and up to date, it's okay the way we want it to be, the next step we have to extract and sort the data. So imagine you're Amazon, you have millions and millions of customers, you have billions of orders per year. You're going to need to extract some of the data at some point. The example I tend to give, let's say uh, it's September, right? And Amazon wants to know how many memory sticks or memory cards do we need to have in stock for September when students are going back to college, going back to uni, going back to secondary school, they're doing coursework. We know that it's typically um, the case where more memory cards are sold during that period. So it just makes more sense for them to have more. So how do they actually get that information? They have to do some data modeling and data modeling can only be done after they've extracted data. They sell millions of things. So they need to extract the data um, that's been saved between September and October, saved on memory sticks made by a particular company sold in a particular area where there are schools. So this is how we, so we extract the data and then we sort the data. This could be ascending order, descending order. We could look for very specific things. So that's the next step. We have to look at extracting and sorting data. So it's extracted from um, unstructured source. So we get all the information we want from, I don't know, an Excel spreadsheet, a text file. It is entered into a system for processing. The data is stored in a database program and this gives it some structure, right? So typically when websites store data, they store it in a CSV, so a comma separated value file or a TXT, just a text file. Um, some even use Excel spreadsheets as well. And finally, the data can be sorted and searched using queries. Specifically, for a lot of data, we use what's known as SQL, so structured query language. That's typically what most databases use. It doesn't have to be. It could be simple, simple database instructions as well. All right, and as I've mentioned before, the next section we have is data modeling. This is where we use the data that has been captured, the data that has been extracted and sorted to try and make some prediction for the future. We have, over the last 50 years, captured rainfall every single day on January 1st. So we can, in some cases, adequately predict if there's going to be rain, if there's going to be sun, if rain, how much rain, uh, if sun, roughly how much sun, or what the temperature is going to be. So data modeling is what helps us to do this. We model the data to then be able to look back and analyze to then predict what could potentially happen um, either now or in the future.